name is James Arati, and I am with Langston University. I'm part of the uh, organizing team members for the summit. And I'll be speaking later, but I want us to uh, get started with our speakers for the afternoon sessions. And uh, all these afternoon sessions are brought to you by Langston University. Uh, you'll see a lot of Langston faces here. If you have some uh, Langston alums, feel free to you know, shout up and uh, you know, cheer your school. Uh, that's good. Uh, but it's uh, nice to have you here, and hopefully we'll have a, a very good and successful summit and uh, get to learn from each other. So to get us started is uh, Dr. Roger Marco. Uh, he's an assistant professor at uh, Langston University. He's a scientist, a research scientist, has a lot of experience in goat research. And uh, he told me to say this, that he served or worked at Langston for a long, long time. I'll let him take over and tell you how long he's worked there and uh, start with his session. <laughs> Thanks, James. Yeah, I've been at Langston for a while. So anyway, to keep the time, I'll get, I'll get going on my uh, presentation as soon as James gets it up for me. What I want to do is, well, first off, how many people are familiar with the Goat Institute at Langston? OK, just a couple of you. What I'm going to do is show a few slides on that first on what we do, uh, some of the activities we have. Then I'll talk a little bit about some things that people who may or who are considering adding goats to a farm or to an operation need to think about. And then a couple of resources that we have for, for folks like that. So the American Institute for Goat Research has been at Langston really since about 1984. We moved up from Prairie View A&M down in Texas. Uh, up here, so we've been around, oh, coming up on, what, the, well, that's almost 40 years now coming up there. I haven't been there quite that long, though. So we do have you know, over 300 acres of fenced land. You can see the goat breeds we have there. Boar and Spanish are our two main meat goat breeds. We have know, 120, 130 uh, alpine does in our milking string. We have a small herd of angora goats for mohair production. Uh, fiber research is not a big part of what we do anymore, unlike when we first began when there were, what, two million angora goats in the state of Texas, you know, in the mid-80s. We have some Tennessee stiff leg goats, the myotonic goats, Tennessee uh, fainting goats, if you will, for some of their muscling uh, properties in the hind quarter. And we actually have three breeds of hair sheep. We have Dorpers, originated from South Africa. Uh, we have Virgin Island St. Croix. And then we have Katahdins, which originated actually in the northeastern portion of the United States. So we've expanded from goats and also have some hair sheep as well. Some of our facilities are computerized milking parlor. We have a dairy product creamery, many different types of individual housing and pens, different types of feeders. Those Kalen gate feeders are ones that have a gate that only open to the animal that wears the appropriate neck ball so we can get individual feed consumption. While they're in a pen setting, they tend to like being in pen settings rather than individually. Fire feeders, that's a feed intake recording equipment feeders, originally designed for the swine industry, but we've used those as well. The goat wears an RFID tag in its ear. When it enters the feeder, then the amount of feed that's in there, ID, even body weight if it's set up, can be recorded. And then when it steps out, the amount of feed consumed can be recorded and you know number of meals per day and that type of thing. We do some work with energy expenditure and we do have some calorimetry chambers. Uh, this is our new barn and this just show you a picture of some of the facilities we have. If you're ever driving by Langston you want to stop in and see and uh, see some things or have a brief tour you can contact me Roger Merkel or just stop by the Goat Institute and we can you know we can accommodate you. The research that we do is really funded by, mainly by competitive grants from the USDA. And as you know, Langston University is an 1890 school. We're an 1890 land grant institution. You know, our partner institution here in Oklahoma is Oklahoma State, an 1862 land grant institution. So we have some capacity building grants and other funds from the USDA that we can apply for, uh, for our research. And that last bullet, that Evans Allen support, that's our standard uh, USDA, USDA support for research. So if we have some projects that really don't fit into a funded grant, 
then they can be funded through our Evans Allen's uh, kind of formula funding, if you will. These are some of the topics of research that we've done in the recent past, and you can, uh, you can read through those. But we've really looked at some things that affect production. Internal parasites is one, and I'll be talking, you know, I have a few slides on that later on. And you can see some of the other things, vegetation management, technology, and nutrition. We have a fair number of nutritionists on staff, so nutrition is a big, is a big uh, issue. In terms of extension, these are some of the workshops we've done in the recent past as well. Uh, COVID has really stopped a number of these. It's a number of these we've kind of working to transition out of, but we do have a goat field day. We are gonna have our goat field day with a limited number of in-person participants this year. And the goat field day is always the last Saturday in April. Every year for the 20 odd years I've been there, it's been the last Saturday in April. And you can see some of the other uh, things that, that we do. This is one I do, tanning goat skins. And I think when uh, someone from Langston gets here, there'll be a couple skins out in the, that area out there for you to take a look at. Uh, we do work internationally. And that third bullet there lists some of the countries that we've worked in and some of the projects. And I won't really spend much time talking about that. But we do have an international reach. And we do have people come to Langston for training from foreign countries. We've had groups from the Philippines. We've had a couple people uh, from Japan, uh, Armenia. We even had a group from North Korea come. I was actually got to go to North Korea, spent, spent a week there, which was, which was interesting. So we'll transition here to if you're thinking of, of raising goats, why would you want to raise goats or why might you consider adding goats to your op uh, operation? First thing is there's really a great demand for goat meat currently in the United States. Um, there's only about two and a half million goats in the United States. About two million of those are meat goats. We slaughter about maybe 600,000 uh, goats per year and almost half of those are slaughtered in the region around New York, New York City. The state that slaughters the most goats is New Jersey. Okay? Oddly enough, but it's New Jersey. About one out of every three goats slaughtered annually is slaughtered in the state of New Jersey just because of that large population on the eastern seaboard that they wish to, uh, th that they wish to supply. Prices for live goats now are, are like over $4 a pound, which is, which is really quite, quite good. There are milk and milk products that a lot of people make and sell, cheese, uh, goat milk soap, lotions, things like that. Actually, some of the people who make goat milk soap don't own goats. They just buy the milk from a dairy and then use that to make their product and they sell. Goats are a good way of utilizing some land on your farm that other livestock species will not. You may have areas that are really brushy, really hilly, uh, rocky. Your cattle may not like them if you have cattle. Goats love those types of, of territories, and they are good for controlling brush. If you wish to rehabilitate, this thing's talking to me over here, sorry, this computer. If you do wish to rehabilitate some lands for cattle production, goats can help you do that as well. And goats, as you know, are smaller than cattle, a bit easier to handle, less capital investment, certainly in uh, uh, facilities and things. So really the things that you need to consider if you are thinking about going into goats are these four things initially, and then there's gonna be some other things that, that you'll need to think of as well. But first is market. And those of you who produce things to sell know that no matter what business you go into, first thing you have to figure out is who are you going to sell to? Are they gonna be interested in your product? How can you reach them? How can you market to them? So what will you sell? and to whom? What type of product uh, do, you, do you wish to produce? Be it meat, milk, or fiber. There are some cashmere goats here in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we have members of the Cashmere Goat Association. Uh, one of their board members is in Sepulpa. She has 100 cashmere producing goats. Cashmere is the finest natural fiber that's grown, uh, real fine, or to qualify as cashmere, the diameter should be less than 19 microns, which is finer than fine wool. Merino wool, if you're familiar with sheep, that has a, a micron in, in the low 20s. 
So cashmere is a very, very fine product, can bring a good price, but you, know, you only get ounces of that per animal per year. So it can, can kind of be hard to, to make your living solely off, off of fiber. Then you have to think of what type of resources you have, land, labor, et cetera, and some production parameters. Uh, internal parasites, predators, and animal health are some, some big things. So who are you going to sell to? Uh, the ethnic market buys a lot of goats. We have uh, some producers at Langston or around Langston that uh, they actually sell some goats to Langston students. We have some international students who are accustomed to consuming goat. They'll actually go to a producer, they'll buy a goat, and they'll slaughter it themselves. You know. Or if you have goats and you are harvesting them, putting them through a, a processing facility, then you would have, have uh, meat for the ethnic market. On-farm sales is one thing, farmer's market. There are some people that do online sales of meat, frozen meat. Obviously, you know, this is going to take some planning to do that. Breeding stock, if you're just starting out, that may be really hard, hard to get into. Auctions, uh, grazing for hire. There are people who raise goats but have no land. And they continuously rent out their goats to either different organizations, government organizations or people, to control unwanted vegetation. Uh, uh, National Park Service sometimes will take goats and use them to get rid of vegetation in an area. The, uh, um, the town of Guthrie used some of our goats once to graze the earthen dam that they have at their lake because it was too steep to mow. So there's that type of opportunities as well. If you are going to go into that, you'd need the goats. You'd probably need some type of fencing. You may need a guardian animal, those types of things. But that is, that is another option. So if you are going to have goats, how are you going to raise them if you have your own farm? Goats love to browse. If you've ever gone by a pasture where goats are, you'll notice that the goats create a browse line. You can see this one on its hind legs. Every leaf on every tree shorter than the top of my head is generally gone because they can reach at least that high. And they just love to, to consume those leaves. You may have rangeland. You may have improved pasture where you would set out plots and have uh, controlled grazing. If you have cattle, goats and cattle are a good, good combination. We'll see that here in the next slide, I think. Hay, you'll probably need some hay during the winter. So do you have you know, resources to make hay? Do you need to purchase hay? You know, what quality hay do you need? Generally for goats, you don't need that real fancy alfalfa hay. You can get by with like a good quality prairie hay or something like that during the winter for the most part. Dry lot or feed lot is starting to become a bit more common with goats. Uh, goats don't seem to be designed for feed lots as are cattle, uh, but there are some producers who, who are doing that. And the reason they're doing that relates to that first thing I mentioned in one of the previous slides. There's a great demand for goat meat and the prices are pretty good. So here if you do have cattle or sheep and goats, this is just kind of a illustration of what types of feedstuffs these species prefer. And you can see cattle, that circles mainly in the grass area. Cattle, mainly grazers, they're going to eat some tree leaves, they're going to eat some weeds, but really they're going to go after your grass. Sheep, again, mainly grass, they're going to consume more of that browse and forbs than our cattle. But if you have goats, you can see what they like. They don't really, they, they don't really want that Bermuda grass. You know, they want that milkweed. You know, they want that lespedeza, you know, they want that buck brush. They want all those forbs that your cattle aren't going to eat. Plus, they're going to be consuming browse, those oak leaves and things that you have on there. So goats and cattle really make a good combination. Now, as you look at this chart, these numbers are per acre, okay? So you can see, you know, excellent pasture. Maybe you can get one cow per acre, half a dozen sheep or goats. If you want to add goats to your cattle, you could add one, maybe two goats per acre with that cow. Again, depending what's out there. If it's just straight grass, yeah, maybe just one. If you have some browse out there and so on, then you can maybe add another one. But the, the main thing here is that those goats are not going to compete against cattle for their total diet because they're going to add things. They're going to consume a lot of things that those cattle won't. So that's really one of the big benefits of adding goats to, 
a cow operation. And you'll see here brush eradication or brush maintenance. And really, a lot of producers go after this brush maintenance because that's what their goats like. If you use your goats to eradicate it, then what are they going to eat next year? So, and to maintain that, that just means you get experience in how heavily you can graze that and when you take the goats off because that brush needs to maintain its root reserves to get through the winter so that in the spring it'll start growing again and those goats are going to have that, that feed source. So these are just some, some things about multi-species grazing. Who's going to raise them? A lot of these uh, farms are family farms. Maybe mom and dad like goats, but maybe teenage son <laughs> doesn't like goats or the teenage daughter doesn't like goats. So you have to figure out what type of labor, what type of labor you have. And the amount of labor obviously is going to depend on the type of goats you have. If you're raising dairy goats, anybody here dairy producer? Family dairy producers? You know you milk you know, day and night, 365 days a year. Goats can uh, have what's called an extended lactation, which means that unlike cattle, they don't need a parturition or a birthing event each year to continue milking. Goats will have, they will kid, they'll have a spike in milk production, it'll go down gently, and then the next year around kidding time, it's gonna spike again, even though they don't kid. It'll be lower, but they'll still produce milk. I know a lady in uh, Nuala, she had one goat, she'd milk continuously for three years, every day for three years. So that's a lot of labor, okay? Thank you, James. Hope you can all see that, okay? Fluid milk, cheese milk, if you are making products, that means you have to take time to produce it plus market it, and that takes away from your uh, time with your goats. And a lot of people get into goats because they like, they like being with the goats. Meat goats, not as much labor. If you do fiber goats, uh, cashmere, you're either going to shear them or a lot of producers comb it. The cashmere uh, will um, naturally shed here in the spring, so they'll just use combs like you would with your dog or cat, and they'll comb that out. Internal parasites. I mentioned I was going to talk about uh, internal parasites. The biggest problem with internal parasites is the barber pole worm, Hamacus contortus. It's a voracious bloodsucker. It uh, takes, and I don't know, can you turn a leg just for a second, James? I need, I need him to see the picture on the left. If you look at that left-hand picture, that's under the microscope of the barber pole worm, and that's what pierces the uh, abomasum, that fourth stomach in the ruminant animals, and starts sucking blood. Okay? So they, they really suck blood, cause anemia, loss production, and they can kill, kill animals. This here picture on the... I guess that was on the right, wasn't it? So the one on the left, my other left, you can see the barber pole worm there, and you can see where it gets its name, the red and white uh, intertwining. What that is, that's the red blood-filled gut intertwining with the white ovary reproductive system that's producing thousands and thousands of eggs daily per worm. This is what can happen if you have an animal that has such a severe infestation that it dies. Those are all barber pole worms that you see in that stomach. We had a go to Langston, died from that, and uh, we cut it open on the back of a gator at the farm. <clears throat> and after that goat died, the worms detached from the abomasum, and it was like looking at live little strands of spaghetti. I mean, they were all just, it was creepy. I mean, they were all just wriggling and writhing in there. So that's a big, big issue. So how can you control these? You can use chemical dewormers called anthelmintics. Um, problem is, is that these worms have developed resistance to almost all the anthelmintics. So those anthelmintics, rather than being effective at, say, a 90% kill rate, maybe it's down to 75 or maybe it's only 60%. Okay? So these worms have developed over time. They've mutated, so they've become resistant to these worms. There are alternative methods, these copper oxide wire particles that I mentioned. You dose those to a goat in a bolus that lodges in the abomasum, and that can help rid your, your goats of, of parasites as well. Alternative management strategies <clears throat> are, are one thing. If you can keep your goats browsing or eating far away from the ground, then they're going to have fewer worms. 
The way these worms transmit themselves is the eggs hatch in the, in the feces. They develop into a first, second, and then a third stage larva. That third stage larva travels up forage on, uh, on water. So after a rain or if there's a heavy dew, then those worms travel up that, that uh, piece of grass. And then those goats or sheep, when they're grazing, they pick that up and that's how they become you know, infested. So if your goats are eating brush, they're eating you know, two, three feet off the ground, there's no worms two, three feet off the ground. So that's another reason why having some brush around would, would be good. A new control method recently introduced into the United States, this was developed in Australia, is this fungus, Duddingtonia flagrans, and it's found in this product called Bioworma. It needs to be fed daily. It's pretty expensive to feed daily, and we're doing some research on it at Langston along with some other schools in the southeast looking at uh, the cost of it, effectiveness, and then perhaps some alternative feeding regimes. What if you feed it every other day instead of daily? Or one week on, one week off, that type of stuff. So we're looking at some of those things. But what this does is it doesn't work inside the animal. So it's not going to deworm your animal, but it's going to, as you can see in that right-hand picture there, that fungus is going to entrap those developing larvae in the feces and eat them. So you're going to have fewer larvae on pasture so your goats don't have the chance to pick up as much. Predators, man, James, I may need a couple more minutes. So predators, these are some of the main predators that we would have around here, coyotes and dogs, bobcats, uh, black vultures. Any of you familiar with black vultures? I mean, what they can do to cattle, what they do is they attack the young. They may, you know, peck at umbilical cord, they'll peck their eyes out, those types of things. And they'll do that to calves as well as, as goat kids. And they seem to be expanded more, more this way. But you can see in 2015, one out of every four goat losses uh, was due to predators, and this is from a USDA report. Coyotes and dogs, about two-thirds of those losses are due to coyotes and dogs. And those dogs may be your neighbor's dogs. Um, we've had dog attacks at Langston, and dogs attacks are just, I mean, they're just horrible because at least the coyote's a professional killer. He's going to kill one, and he's going to eat it. You get dogs in there. They get all riled up, you know, and they're going to, I mean, they could kill five, six, injure seven or eight more just because they're, you know, they're just going wild. So I'd rather have a coyote than, than a pack of dogs. Guardian animals, normally people think of guardian dogs, but actually donkeys and llamas work pretty well. Fencing, fencing can help keep those predators out. Uh, permanent fencing is generally exterior. Depending on your, your setup, your, you may have permanent fencing you know, in, uh, making some smaller pastures inside, inside your farm. We use electric netting a lot when we're doing small plot grazing and things, and that works real well. That electric netting, um, we have some up there right now. It's at, I think, 9,000 9, volts. There's nothing going through 9,000 volts if, it, if they touch it. So the electric netting works pretty well. So this is what you don't want to see on the trail camera you have set out in your pasture. This was a Langston. You can see the, uh, uh, the feed, that plastic feed trough behind there. At one in the afternoon, there were goats all around that feed trough. And here you can see at, what was that? Quarter 11 at night, then this, then this coyote was in, in the pasture. Animal health, just like everything, learn about your animals, then you'll know when they're acting strange, something is probably gonna, gonna be up. You should know a little bit about the vital signs and some basic procedures to, do, uh, to be able to do that. And you need a veterinarian to work with because this really tells you why. There's only 25 approved drugs for goats. There are 496 approved for cattle. There's more money in cattle drugs than there are in goat drugs is basically what it is. But your veterinarian can prescribe a drug for you off-label if it's in the context of this vet client patient relationship. So the vet has to have been to your farm, examined the animals, determined no approved drug exists, give you that drug or prescribe that drug and then tell you how to use it and give you a withdrawal time. So that first bullet there means that you cannot just call a veterinarian and say, hey, I need some antibiotics for my goats. He or she is not going to give them to you. 
because that's not part of this VCPR. So some of the, uh, as you can see, there's a fair number of things to know about raising goats. Just there is about raising anything. You're raising tomatoes, vegetables, whatever. There's a lot that goes into it. We do have some resources at Langston uh, that can help you. We do have these production handbooks. And uh, my handsome assistant, James, back there has a couple he'll show you. We have them for meat goats, dairy goats, the, uh, uh, the full books. These are like 400, 500 pages of information. And then we have some basics books that have information extracted from the big books in about 10 or 12 chapters. So they're, they're pretty good, good resources to have. Another thing we have is we've taken those books and we've made them into online training courses. So we have online certification courses that you can enroll in and go through all that material in really a, a, a formatted environment. So it kind of forces you to go through. You take a pretest on a module, and if you don't score 85%, then you have to read through the module and then take a post-test. Okay? And there are um, required modules and there's elective modules, and that's all explained on the website. To go through all these courses is free. I mean, this doesn't cost you anything to enroll, to go through the courses. If you complete and you want a certificate, uh, then we have a $25 fee, but that's it. Other than that, if you just want to get on and browse through all that stuff and look at it, feel free. Okay, that's, that's what we want. So these have been pretty popular. As you can see here, we have almost 725 people that have gone through some version of this course. The dairy goat, 190. The meat goat, which has been up considerably longer, 480. The Spanish versions, uh, we've had 14 and 40. And we've had producers from 20 different countries complete these courses. So we do kind of have a world worldwide reach even with this. We just had a group from Chile of uh, uh, extension agents go through. I think there were 18 or 19 of them. And their supervisor found out about this course through a person we're working with at the University of Puerto Rico. And she looked at it and had some of her extension agents go through. So it's, it's worked out well for them. So this is our website, goats.langston.edu. Uh, feel free to, to visit. My name again is Roger Merkel, M-E-R-K-E-L. And I don't have a decent card, so if you want my email address, it's my last name, M-E-R-K-E-L at langston.edu. And if you forget my last name, just think of my distant cousin Angela Merkel, former chancellor of Germany. No, I don't think we're related. But we do have, if I want to be related to someone in Merkel, I want the guys who, who own Merkel shotguns, because they would have the money. But anyway. Well, thanks for your attention. I may have, according to James, like 20 seconds for a question. So. No, that fungus just passes right through. Mouth to the rear end. That's it. What's the cost of this dairy goat? Uh, 40. Yep, you'll see them. If you order online, I don't know, it's like 50 or 60. But since you're all here, that's just 40 if you're here. So, And the thin ones are 20. And you can look through those at the table with uh, Ms. Golden when she gets here out, out over there. So, yeah. And the uh, material in the online certification program is exactly the material from the book. The modules are the individual chapters. So, and those, after you take the pretest, you can access the PDF of those as well. And that you could probably download or you know, whatever you want. So, I mean, we just want this information to get out to people. That's all. Mm -hmm.